Good evening and welcome to the Songers Center here at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. It's great to have you here. This is part of our speaker series that we're sponsoring here at the university. One of the reasons we wanted to have this Songers Center was to make it a student convocation center where we had events just like this and we are delighted to have author Stephen King here this evening. But th think about it, for 35 years, Stephen King has been at the top of his profession. What a tremendous career, and he's here tonight. 50 books, 350 million copies printed. 50 of his works have become either movies or television programs. He is clearly one of the incredible literary giants of our time, and we are delighted to have him here. An amazing thing about him being here tonight is he has decided and his wife Tabitha have decided that he is not going to accept any money tonight and he's going to donate 100% of his fee to scholarships for UMass Lowell students. So that means 100% of the proceeds for tonight are going to go to scholarships for students in our English department. And I have to tell you, we have a fabulous English department at UMass Law, led by Tony Seschel. I don't, where is Tony? Right here. They're a fabulous department with outstanding faculty, and they have been on a roll this year. Uh, we celebrated a collaboration with the uh, National Park here in Lowell, uh, Dickens and Lowell, which is a celebration of Charles Dickens' uh, 200th uh, birthday, but also his visit to the city of Lowell in 1842. It was a great event. And then we also collaborated with the Merrimack Repertory Theater uh, because Jack Kerouac is from Lowell, and uh, his, his only play, full play that he wrote, was a collaboration with our English department, Beat Generation, and that got worldwide attention. And that's our English department, and they are co-sponsors of tonight's event as well. And again, all the proceeds go to the English department. Now, these are two very nice chairs. I like to, I like to mark it. Now, Stephen King is going to sign both of these chairs, and there's an auction. May, many of you may have seen it. It's $10 a ticket, and 100% of the proceeds will go to scholarships for our students who are English majors. So I would urge any of you, they're all going to be on sale in the concourse throughout uh, this event. So if you haven't bought one or you want to up your chances of winning, feel free to buy a, a raffle for this. Uh, I'm going to call, actually, uh, we're going to, we call this uh, a conversation with, I also, by the way, want to thank our sponsors tonight. They have all contributed to make this event a success, and thank you to all of the sponsors. We call this a conversation with Stephen King, and that conversation is going to be held uh, with one of our fabulous, fabulous faculty members in the English department, Andre Debuse III. Now, I would never call somebody my favorite faculty member, however, um, he is a, a fabulous author. He's already written uh, five books, um, uh, two of them, the New York Times bestseller. In fact, the book Townie, if you haven't read it yet, it's on sale tonight. And it, Andre didn't ask me to do this, but it's on sale tonight. It's a fabulous book, it's a memoir. And any of you who have grown up either in the Merrimack Valley or in any urban area anywhere in the world, this is a fabulous read and I would encourage you to read it. But we are so pleased to have Andre Debus III on our faculty. He grew up in the Merrimack Valley. He identifies with students. He's a fabulous uh, faculty member. And Andre is going to be uh, sort of having this conversation with Stephen King. Please welcome Andre Debus III and Stephen King. Thank you. Same as 
Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? You know what? I think we ought to stop right here. This is the high point. This of is evening. it, brother. And good night. <laughs> so uh, nice, nice to see you all. Glad you came out to our little soiree. It's scary as shit to see so many people. <laughs> this, is, it is this is my first stadium show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his first stadium show. So here's what I want to do. Uh, we're going to kind of divide the night up into three parts. Mr. King and I are going to shoot the breeze for about half an hour about various subjects. And then we have a real special treat. He's going to debut a brand new short story that no one's heard, laid eyes on, or read tonight. <laughs> its world premiere is right here at the Strongest Arena. Andre thinks it's special because he hasn't read it. Yeah. <laughs> well. And so, and then after he reads, we're going to turn it over to you guys and do some, uh, just a conversation Q&A with Mr. King. Um, let me just jump in for a second on a little intro about my when friend. When did here. I become Mr. King to you? All right, well, I'm, I call him Stevie. He calls me Andre Dubas. So I'll call, we'll do that. Uh, look, it's- You can it's, call it's, me anything you want as long as the check doesn't bounce. You know what I'm saying? Did Marty mention that, by the way? Okay. Look, uh, the truth is, this man needs no introduction. But I do want to say just a couple of things about, about Steve. Never mind the 350 million books sold worldwide. <laughs> by the way, you probably don't know that you've outsold Charles Dickens times two. It's incredible. Um, he didn't have e-books. Never mind, yeah, e-books. <laughs> never mind the 50-some-odd film adapt adaptations. <laughs> Some of which were good. <laughs> never mind his wicked good American Express commercial. We'll talk about that. You're dating yourself. I now, am. I am dating myself. Andre. And also, Steve's won dozens and dozens of prestigious awards, including the National Book Foundation's Distinguished uh, Honor for American Letters, Contribution to American Letters. And there's another award that a lot of people don't know about that I, I think is, is really germane here. Poets and Writers Magazine gave him the Writers for Writers Award. Because the man is really generous with writers who will never have his readership or even a fraction of it. And I just, I want to tell a quick story and then we're going to start. We met 25 years ago. Do you believe that? 25 years ago, I was two. <laughs> he was six. If, a lot of you may know that my father was the great short story writer, Andre de We were younger and, was, and hornier in those days. Yeah, that's right. We were. Hey, speak for yourself. <laughs> Bada bing. <laughs> We'll be here all week, folks, really. My father, uh, my father was run over and, and crippled in a, in a car accident in 1986. And Steve King, John Irving, E.L. Doctorow, about six or seven other real prominent writers um, chipped in their talents to raise money for my father's astronomical medical bills he couldn't pay. And so the first time I met Steve was in 1987 at the Charles Hotel uh, when he was reading from a story that I still remember about a woman who is cleaning the closet and accidentally shoots herself and doesn't realize it till the end of the day. Revelations yeah. of Becca Pulse and later became a part of a book called The Tommy Knockers. Oh, the yeah. the Tommy Knockers! <laughs> so I, I, we're going to get to it, but uh, truly what I love about this man even more than his profound work and contribution to American Letters is He's a good man, and he's a giving man, and he's a generous man, and it shows by Jesus, you're making me sound like I died. You ain't dead yet. So, it's generosity. <laughs> now, 
I'm going to throw out a few softballs, and he's just going to wink. He's going to hit them. I need my glasses, though. Hold on. Steve, tell the joke while I'm looking for my glasses. Okay, you're looking for your glasses? Yeah, I'm looking for my glasses. All okay. right. I'm going to read a, a quote from... Uh, by the way, for all of you writers out there, if you have not read Stephen's uh, On Writing, a memoir of the craft, you must. It's a beautiful book. This is like Steve King's greatest hits. <laughs> oh, wait, Play you... Free Bird. <laughs> light, your, light your lighters later. You know, I don't know what these questions are, and if we, I don't we know have the not answer, rehearsed. I'm just going to say, fuck yeah, you know? <laughs> okay, in the, in the green room, we just told dirty jokes. So here we go. You told dirty jokes. <clears throat> yeah, but you laughed. I talked about <laughs> literature. <laughs> All right, okay. I'm going to get serious now. He says they're going to be softball questions, so. Here we go. This is a quote from On Writing, and I love it for very many reasons. Primarily because not enough writers talk about it in this way. Talk about the, the, the craft of writing. Stories are found relics, part of an undiscovered pre-existing world, Stephen King says. He also says he's against plotting and the spont because plotting and the spontaneity of real creation are not compatible. Expound, sir. <laughs> it's like taking the SATs. I think, myself, that, you know, I don't start with a story that's... Uh, I was telling a writing class today that the... Uh, kind of the scariest thing I ever heard, I was doing a writing thing with John Irving, who put that thing together for your dad, by the way, and it, it's worth mentioning that when Andre's dad was hurt, he had stopped to help another pedestrian. And that's how that happened. Um, but in any case, John Irving, when he was talking to a bunch of would-be writers one time, said that the first thing he does with a book is write the last line of that book. And I heard that, and I just went, you know, like that. Because to me, that's kind of like spoiling the fun. I like to start with a little bit of an idea. You know, uh, they come from different places. Sometimes they stick around and you want to do something. Sometimes they don't. But the idea is to start with something and just start to go with it, you know. And uh, that's the joy of finding things out, of having characters that just sort of walk on and become a big part of the story. When I wrote The Green Mile, I had no idea where it was yeah. going. Thank you, thank you. I, I had no idea where that was going. I started with an idea about a, a guy uh, who was in prison and he was the snack guy who went around, he was a trustee and he went around with a snack wagon and he had a little tame mouse that uh, rode on the, on the cart. And of course, the mouse m made it into the story but the rest of it didn't. But little by little it just sort of built itself up, and the way that the pieces came together at the end was terrific. I like that. But how did the guy in pushing the cart down the prison hallway come to you? It just came and it staring That was head? where it started, and th those are the sort of the mysterious parts of it. Sometimes there's no way to say where things come from. I know that uh, back around 1976 or 1977, I had a Honda 500 motorcycle and it started to miss and uh, jerk, and, and uh, I didn't really know how to fix it. I messed around with it a little bit, and this guy said, um, well, there's a fellow about seven miles up out in the woods who's really good with small engines, and he's got this unique way of doing business. He says what a thing's going to cost, and that, that's what it ends up costing you. So I thought that was a good idea, so I got on my motorcycle <laughs> and I drove out there to this guy's farm, and it really was out in East Jupipi. So I got out there, and there was a little tiny farmhouse, and there was this big barn, and I could hear him inside working with stuff. I got into the dooryard, and the motorcycle died on me. And out of this barn 
became the biggest goddamn St. Bernard dog you ever saw in your life. And he started to walk toward me, and I hear, <laughs> and you know their eyes are sort of pussy. Have you ever noticed that about St. Bernard's, particularly when it's warm, they kind of get this gluck coming out of them. And the guy who ran the place came out, he was wearing overalls, and he had an, he had an adjustable socket wrench on a, you know, on a ball thing. And he said, oh, that's Buster. He does that to everyone, but he loves people. He won't hurt you. <laughs> so I reached down, which you should never do to a dog, to Buster, to show him what a good guy I was. And, <laughs> and Buster just went down on his haunches. I mean, this was, dog was 150, 160 pounds. He just went down, and he started to come up. And that guy brought that socket wrench down on him. It was like an, a rug beater hitting a rug. And the dog just shrank down, and there wasn't a word of apology. He just said, Buster must not like your looks. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't like his looks very much either. But that kind of stuck in my mind, and I thought to myself, well, I was on my motorcycle and unprotected, but what if, because it's always a what if, that's kind of like the magic thing. What if the guy hadn't been here, and what if I was in a little car that stopped and it was hot? And that was sort of the genesis for Cujo. You know, um, yeah. <laughs> and actually, John Irving, I think, is, is unusual in, in I, don't, I don't think a lot of novelists outline their stories. He's very smart and, and good at it. but. Uh, so you begin with the situation first and character second. The characters come as you're exploring the situation that's fueled by the question, what if? Yeah, I mean, I could say about Cujo, uh, okay, we're talking about a, a woman. Finally, I decided it was going to be a woman uh, who wants to protect her son. And then little by little, that character starts to develop like an old-fashioned film play in developing fluid. So you say to yourself, well, okay, this is how old she is. This is what her background is. This is what she does. She's cheating on her husband. That's another fact. And a lot of the things just sort of come together, work together, and you let them. That's the thing. You don't try to manage these people or push them around. You just sort of let them be what they're going to be. It's good. It's a great job. This is wonderful, you know? I mean, I make all these things up. And you know, people who do that, like go to psychiatrists, <laughs> and they pay like 70 bucks an hour, and it's not a full hour, it's like 50 minutes. <laughs> I make all this shit up, and people pay me. <laughs> it's great, you know? Thank you. All right, so you guys put my kids through college, and I scared the shit out of you while I was doing it. It's terrific. <laughs> It's a win-win. <laughs> All right, Pete, uh, speaking of people paying you, so I told Steve, I'd get, I did give him a little hint about what I might be doing. So I'm going to ask a few craft questions, and I'm going to ask a few glitzy fame and fortune business questions. And I'm going to ask the big one up front about the fact is it is really rare for a writer to be as recognizable as this man is. Maybe since Hemingway's days, Hemingway was a really recognizable writer. But I have to give you a st quick story from a few years ago about how famous this guy is. <laughs> so we did this, remember that thing we did at the Four or Six Club uh, at Fenway Park? Right. And it was about baseball writing, and Updike was there, and Doris Kern, it's a good wood, and it was a lovely night. Anyway, the next day, this big poor thunderstorm. guy. Big You remember there was a big, that? wasn't there a big thunderstorm that night? Yeah, it was raining. Yeah. And, um, why are you asking? I just making conversation, man. <laughs> yeah, Steve, it was raining wicked hot. So what? <laughs> so anyway, the next big day, thunderstorm. It was scary. It was like the end of the world. The next day, the poor man's just walking across the street to get a cup of coffee. The Ver a Verizon truck drives by, and the driver of the Verizon truck yells, "Yo, Stevie, cool <laughs> Joe, <Kujo>, yeah!" <laughs> That's Boston. I mean, that, <laughs> that kind of thing does happen from time to time in Boston, you know. It's really funny. All right, so look. Everybody about, yeah, the... Oh, John Coffey, you rock! <laughs> but 
But that does not happen to any other writer. Maybe J.K. Rowling now, but they wouldn't be that. They wouldn't say, yo, J.K., love you, baby. Won't happen. My, my favorite story is like uh, oh, probably maybe 25 years ago when my hair was actually dark and I had a, I had a black beard. I had a big black beard. And uh, I was not, I was a writer. I mean, we're supposed to be the secret agents of the arts, okay? We cruise around and see what you guys are doing and end up putting it in books. So this is a, a strange situation for me. So about 25 years ago, when I really was kind of a secret agent, I'd published maybe six or seven books, but you know, it wasn't a big deal. And I went in Nathan's, the hot dog place in New York, and I got up to the counter, I sat down on the stool, and I, I ordered a, a foot long, you know, and a, you know, one of those uh, orange drinks or something. And I'm sipping my drink, and I'm waiting for my hot dog. And I look through the pass-through into the kitchen, and the cook's looking at me, and he sees me looking at him, and he's right away, he's cooking again, cooking again. <laughs> so I, I go back, I'm, I'm reading my book, I read just about everywhere, and I'm reading my book, and I look up. Oh, he, he's down there. <laughs> So finally he comes out, and I'm thinking to myself, now remember, I had the big beard and I had on uh, the dark 70s type glasses. It's embarrassing now, but that's the way we rolled back then. That's all there is to it. So, <laughs> so he walks out, and I think to myself, this guy recognized me. He knows who I am. He walks up to me, he goes, are you somebody famous? <laughs> and I say, well, a little bit. <laughs> he says, you know, like you do something artistic, right? I go, well, not all critics agree, but <laughs> I like to think so. He says, you're Francis Ford Coppola, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Yes, I am. <laughs> because everybody who does this, you, me, everybody else who does this, we're fucking liars. You know, <laughs> how do you know we're lying, our mouths are moving? So he asked me for an autograph and I gave him one. <laughs> and, and did I regret that? <laughs> the hell I did, I thought it was great. But the other thing is people do this cross check thing in their brains and they'll come up to me and say, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and I'll say, yes. But I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you one story, and, Please, and then no. we'll get back to this, because I love this. I knew a guy named Dave Marsh, because he used to be in the critics' chorus in this group called the Rock Bottom Remainders, where I play a little <laughs> rhythm guitar. And one day, this goes back quite a ways, you know, like 20 years, and he says to me, uh, Bruce Springsteen would like to meet you. Would you like to have dinner with Bruce Springsteen? And I said, oh, yes, that would be nice. <laughs> so we did. We, we went to this little cafe down in the village, and it was, you know, a bar in front and tables in the back. And we were sitting, and he's a really nice guy, and, and we were having, uh, uh, you know, corned beef and cabbage sandwiches or whatever, or, and beer, because I was still drinking in those days. And uh, so... This party came in. There was a husband and a wife and their daughter who was about 16 years old. And all you had to do was to look at her and know it was a special day for her. Probably her birthday, maybe her parents were taking her out for that. But she had on this white blouse and a, a necklace, a gold necklace, and this nice skirt that was multicolored. And she was wearing her best shoes and everything and her hair was done and they're sitting in there eating and all this other stuff and then she looks over like that and it, she just like flipped you know i mean it wasn't like she ah screamed or anything like that but she got up and she walked to our table and it was like her feet didn't touch the floor she was like a sleepwalker dreamwalker something this beautiful 16 year old <laughs> girl and I could see Bruce getting his pen out of his pocket. She never fucking looked at him. Yeah! <laughs> Cut it out! Yeah! She said, 
Are you Stephen King? I've read almost all your books. I'd die for your autograph. So. <laughs> and that, that was the apex of it. You know what? What's so great about that story is I think, I think so many writers want to be rock and roll stars, man. So that's so sweet. Yeah, all right, well, look, I gotta, and it, look, if it's too personal and tell me to shut up, I know you will. But there's got to be a downside to not be able to walk across the street without the Verizon truck guy yelling at you. The first time that I ever gave an autograph, you know, you do this thing where, and some of you heard this story before, but I, I never get tired of telling it because it's like a trauma. It's like one of those basic traumas of your life. I'm going to make it real short. I did a tour. It was the first book tour. It was for The Shining. And I did it with Kitty Kelly, who wrote, at that time she had a book about Frank Sinatra. Uh, my mother used to call him Frankie the Snot, but that's beside the point. <laughs> and, and Jersey Kosinski was with us too. So we did this tour and we ended up in a lot of cities. And the last one was Pittsburgh. And in those days, you did this thing where you did all the media that you could and the local paper put on a dinner at night and there's pictures and all that other stuff. And this thing was way up in this fancy restaurant on what they call the Incline in, in Pittsburgh. And I got sick. I mean, I really got sick. It was Montezuma's Revenge, and I don't want to get all uh, clinical about it, but I'll just say that I rushed to the bathroom, and the bathroom was Babylonian. I mean, it was this huge thing and everything, and there was an attendant, and the only thing was the stalls didn't have doors. You just said, but I was beyond caring about that, you know. <laughs> I went in there and everything came out that could possibly come out. This and is just between us now. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm getting to the point. So, I mean, this wave of depression came over me because I wasn't used to being away. I missed my wife, I missed my kids. Uh, the whole thing about the morning TV and everything. I just wanted to get home. And I'm thinking to myself, things can't get any worse. And I see the bathroom attendant. 116 years old, advancing on me with a pad and a pen. <laughs> and he says, I think I saw you on AM Pittsburgh. Can I have your autograph? <laughs> and it's the only one I ever gave in the shithouse. <laughs> so that's the downside. That okay? is the downside. Yeah. Uh, all right, I'm going to go back to a, a substantial craft question. You've spoken a lot about uh, your novels come together through two previously unrelated ideas. They come together and they make something new under the sun. You go on to say your job isn't to find these ideas, but recognize them when they show up. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you might want to give a concrete example, maybe with your first novel. You mean, you, we're talking about Carrie yeah. here? Yeah, the two of it. The well, two. yeah! Yeah, you too. <laughs> Isn't this an amazing crowd? Give yourselves a hand while I think about that. Uh, as a student, I knew a couple of girls uh, who were at the very bottom of the social pecking order. You know, high school is probably the most savage social caste system that America has. You know, it's very divided and popularity becomes very important and it's very difficult for adolescents because they're not emotionally grounded yet and these girls were the absolute bottom and uh, one of them later committed suicide but I had a chance to watch that ostrac you know that ostracism in, in progress and then later as a teacher I saw the same thing from the other side of the desk and uh, those two things came together for me along with a number of articles that I'd seen about the possibility that psychokinetic phenomena, if it existed, probably existed in teenagers and probably existed in disturbed teenage girls. And I thought this would make a terrific book, so I wrote it. I threw it away, and my wife picked it out of the trash. Um, Thank God. And she's never let me forget it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, look, man, this, you got to tell the story about, if you have not read uh, On Writing, what, what, it's, it's really a really a wonderful book in many ways, but the first half's a little memoir uh, of Stephen's start in the world. And like a lot of people, he started out with nothing. 
single mom, a brother, and him living in real, real, real deep first world poverty. And one of the, one of the things I love about your book is it's also a lovely homage to you and your wife. And 40 years together, that's not, it's no small thing. But we, got, we actually have to pretty soon move, move to your reading, which is going to be great. I just, would you mind telling them that great story of when you got the call from your paperback editor <laughs> and, your, and the, in the place you were living and how you were living and where you were working? It's a they, great story. They tore our, uh, our apartment down last year, and I got a picture of the empty lot, and it was, it was really sort of great because that place was a real shithole. It was awful. <laughs> It was 22 Sanford Street in Bangor, Maine, and we were at the bottom. We had a couple of kids. Uh, we had absolutely no money whatsoever, and uh, we didn't have a, a, really anything to speak of. The cupboards were pretty well empty, and, and uh, my wife had taken our old car that needed a new transmission that day. It was a Sunday, and she'd gone up to Old Town to see her parents. And uh, I got a call <laughs> from Bill Thompson, who edited my first books. And coincidentally, he was also the guy who discovered John Grisham with a book called A Time to Kill. So Bill called me on the phone. I was in the house by myself, the apartment. <clears throat> and uh, I was standing in the doorway between our crappy kitchen and our even crappier dining room, and he said, he said, we sold the paperback rights to carry. I'd gotten an advance, but it was for $2,500, and they're gone to fix the car and, and to buy diapers and things like that. And I said, oh, my God, you sold the paperback? How much did you sell it for? And he said, $250,000. <laughs> no, no, that wasn't it, because it was a 50-50 split. He said, we sold it for $400,000. I got two hundred, dollars And I... I couldn't believe it, and I said, Bill, did you say $40,000? <laughs> and he said, no, we sold your paperback for $400,000, and I'm in this crappy little apartment in Bangor, Maine, with two pairs of jeans and really not much else, and all the strength went out of my legs, and I just sort of accordioned down until I was sitting on the floor, and we talked about it for a while, and I finally got it through my head, and the thought that came to my mind was, I must buy a present for my wife, who fished this book out of the trash. <laughs> and I have to get her something. And I, I went out, and it, it was Sunday. And this was, you, you have to realize that this was in the old days when malls were largely, like, not there. It was just downtown Bangor. And the only place that was open was the Rexall station. The, the Rexall <laughs> drugstore, so I bought her a hair dryer. <laughs> a hair dryer. Oh, Lord. So, look, we're going to get to uh, this world debut of this new story, but I'm going to read, if you don't mind, I'm going to read you two paragraphs from your book, Stephen. You okay. wrote it. And I'm going to read it to you. Hit me. And I'm actually reading this to you all because I think it says something beautiful about this man and his view of what he does that has enriched us all and will, will last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, you may know or may not know that Stephen was in a horrible car accident, not car accident, some idiot ran him over in 1999 and he almost died. And he can tell you that story if he wants, but you have to have the context because in this brief passage I want to read to you before he reads us the new story, uh, he's coming back from a real painful convalescence from this horrible accident. On some days, that writing is a pretty grim slog. On others, more and more of them as my leg begins to heal and my mind reaccustoms itself to its old routine, I feel that buzz of happiness, that sense of having found the right words and put them in a line. It's like lifting off in an airplane. You're on the ground, on the ground, on the ground, and then you're up, riding on a magical cushion of air and prints of all you survey. That makes me happy because it's what I was made to do. Writing isn't about making money, getting famous, getting dates, getting laid, or making friends. In the end, it's about enriching the lives of those who will read your work and enriching your own life as well. It's about getting up, getting well, and getting over. Getting happy, okay? Getting happy. 
Writing is magic, as much the water of life as any other creative art. The water is free, so drink. Drink and be filled up. Oh, thank you. Yeah, man. Do you want to hear a story? Yeah! yeah. This is uh, brand new, so I don't know if it's any good or not, but it's called, it has a very Stephen King title, it's called Afterlife. William Andrews, an investment banker with Goldman Sachs, dies on the afternoon of September 23rd, 2012. It is an expected death. His wife and adult children are at his bedside. That evening, when she finally allows herself some time alone, away from the steady stream of family and condolence visitors, Lynn Andrews calls her oldest friend who still lives in Milwaukee. It was Sally Freeman who introduced her to Bill, and if anyone deserves to know about the last 60 seconds of their marriage, it's Sally. He was out of it for most of the last week, the drugs, but conscious at the end. His eyes were open, and he saw me. He smiled. I took his hand, and he squeezed it a little. I bent over and kissed his cheek. When I straightened up again, he was gone. She has been waiting for hours to say this, and with it said, she bursts into tears. Her assumption that the smile was for her is natural enough, but mistaken. As he is looking up at his wife and three gr grown children, they seem impossibly tall, creatures of angelic good health inhabiting a world he is now departing. Bill feels the pain he has lived with for the past 18 months leave his body. It pours out like slop from a bucket, so he smiles. With the pain gone, there's little left. His body feels as light, light as a fluff of milkweed. His wife takes his hand, reaching down from her tall and healthy world. He has reserved a little bit of strength, which he now expends by squeezing her fingers. She bends down. She is going to kiss him. Before her lips can touch his skin, a hole appears in the center of his vision. It's not a black hole, but a white one. It spreads, obliterating the only world he's known since 1956, when he was born in the small Hemingford County Hospital in Nebraska. During the last year, Bill has read a great deal about the passage from life to death. On his computer, always careful to obliterate the history so as not to upset Lynn, who is constantly and unrealistically upbeat. And while most of it struck him as bullshit, the so-called white light phenomenon seemed quite plausible. For one thing, it has been reported in all cultures. For another, it has a smidgen of scientific credibility. One theory he's read suggests the white light comes as a result of the sudden cessation of blood flow to the brain. Another, more elegant, posits that the brain is performing a final global scan in an effort to find an experience comparable to dying. Or it may just be a final firework. Whatever the cause, Bill Andrews is now experiencing it. The white light obliterates his family and the airy room from which the mortuary assistants will soon remove his sheeted, breathless body. In his researches, he became familiar with the acronym NDE, standing for near-death experience. In many of these experiences, the white light becomes a tunnel, at the end of which stand beckoning family members who have already died, or friends, or angels, or Jesus, or some other beneficent deity. Bill expects no welcoming committee. What he expects is for the final firework to fade to the blackness of oblivion. But that doesn't happen. When the brilliance dims, he's not in heaven or hell. He's in a hallway. He supposes it could be purgatory, a hallway painted industrial green and floored and scuffed in dirty tile could very well serve as purgatory, but only if it went on forever. This one ends 20 feet down at a door with a sign on it reading, Isaac Harris, manager. Bill stands, <laughs> Bill stands where he is for a few moments, inventorying himself. 
He's wearing the pajamas he died in, at least he assumes he died, and he's barefooted, but there's no sign of the cancer that first tasted his body, then gobbled it, but down to nothing but skin and skeleton. He looks to be back at about 190, which was his fighting weight, slightly soft-bellied, granted, before the cancer struck. He feels his buttocks in the small of his back. The bed sores are gone. Nice. He takes a deep breath and exhales without coughing. Even nicer. He walks a little way down the hall. On his left is a fire extinguisher with a peculiar graffito above it. Better late than never. <laughs> On his right is a bulletin board. On this, a number of photographs have been pinned, the old-fashioned kind with decal edges. Above them is a hand-printed banner reading, Company Picnic, 1956. What fun we had. <laughs> Bill examines the photographs, which show executives, secretaries, office personnel, and a gaggle of romping kids. There's a, there are guys tending a barbecue, one wearing the obligatory joke toque, guys and gals tossing horseshoes, guys and gals playing volleyball, guys and gals swimming in a lake. The guys are wearing bathing suits that look almost obscenely short and tight to his 21st century eye but very few are carrying big guts. They have 50s physiques, Bill thinks. The gals are wearing those old-fashioned Esther Williams tank suits, the kind that make women look as if, not as if they have buttocks, but only a kind of cleftless bulge above the backs of their thighs. <laughs> Hot dogs are being consumed. Beer is being drunk. Everyone appears to be having a whale of a good time. In one of the pictures, he sees Richie Blankmore's father handing Anne-Marie Winkler a toasted marshmallow. This is ridiculous because Richie's dad was a truck driver and never went to a company picnic in his life. Anne-Marie was a girl he dated in college. In another photo, he sees Bobby Tisdale, a college classmate from the early 70s. Bobby, who referred to himself as Tiz the Wiz, died of a heart attack while still in his 30s. He was probably on earth in 1956, but would have been in kindergarten or the first grade, not drinking beer on the shore of Lake Whatever. In this picture, the Wiz looks about 20, which would have been his age when Bill knew him. In a third picture, Eddie Scarponi's mom is baffing a volleyball. Eddie was Bill's best friend when the family moved from Nebraska to Paramus, New Jersey, and Gina Scarponi once glimpsed sunning herself on the patio in filmy white panties and nothing else, was one of Bill's favorite fantasies when he was still on his masturbation learner's permit. <laughs> the guy in the joke toke is Ronald Reagan. Bill looks closely, his nose almost pressing against the black and white photo, and there can be no doubt, the 40th president of the United States is flipping burgers at a company picnic. What company, though? Where exactly is he? His euphoria at being whole again and pain-free is fading. What replaces it is a growing sense of dislocation and unease. Seeing these familiar people in photographs doesn't make sense, and the fact that he doesn't know the majority of them offers marginal comfort at best. He looks behind him and sees stairs leading up to another door. Printed on this one in large block red letters is LOCKED. That leaves only Mr. Harris's office. Bill walks down there, hesitates, knocks. It's open! Bill walks in. <laughs> Beside a cluttered desk stands a fellow in baggy, high-waisted suit pants held up by suspenders. His brown hair is plastered to his skull and parted in the middle. He wears rimless glasses. The walls are covered with invoices and corny leg art cheesecake pics that make Bill think of the trucking company Richie Blankmore's dad worked for. He went there a few times with Richie, and the dispatch office looked like this. According to the calendar on one wall, it's March of 1911, which makes no more sense than 1956. To Bill's right as he enters, there's a door. To his left is another. There are no windows, but a glass tube comes out of the ceiling and dangles over a Dan Duck's laundry basket. The basket is filled with a heap of yellow sheets that look like more like invoices, or maybe they're memos. 
Files are piled two feet high on the chair in front of the desk. Bill Anderson, isn't it? The man goes behind the desk and sits down. There's no offer to shake hands. Andrews, right, and I'm Harris. Here you are again, Andrews. <laughs> Given all Bill's research on dying, this comment actually makes sense, and it's a relief. As long as he doesn't have to come back as a dung beetle or something. So, it's reincarnation, is that the deal? Isaac Harris sighs. You always ask the same thing, and I always give the same answer. Not really. <laughs> I'm dead, aren't I? Do you feel dead? No, but I saw the white light. Ah, oh, yes, <laughs> the famous white light. There you were, and here you are. Wait a minute, just hold the phone. Harris breezes through the papers on his desk, doesn't find what he wants, and starts opening drawers. From one of them, he takes a few more folders and selects one. He opens it, flips a page or two, and nods. Just refreshing myself a bit. Investment banker, aren't you? Yes. Wife, three kids, two sons, one daughter? Correct. Apologies, I have hundreds of pilgrims, and it's hard to keep them straight. I keep meaning to put these folders in some sort of order, but that's really a secretarial job, and <laughs> since they've never provided me with one, who is they? No idea, all communications come via the tube. He taps it. The tube sways, then stills. Runs on compressed air. Latest thing. <laughs> Bill picks up the folders on the client's chair and looks at the man behind the desk, eyebrows raised. Just put them on the floor, Harris says. That'll do for now. One of these days, I really am going to get organized. If there are days. Probably are. Nights, too, but who can say for sure? No windows in here, as you will have noticed. Also, no clocks. Bill sits down. Why call me a pilgrim if it's not reincarnation? Harris leans back and laces his hands behind his neck. He looks up at the pneumatic tube, which probably was the latest thing at some time or other, say around 1911, although Bill supposes such things might still have been in use around 1956. Harris shakes his head and chuckles, although not in a, an amused way. If you only knew how wearisome you guys become. <laughs> According to the files, this is our 15th visit. I've never been here in my life, Bill says. He considers this. Except it's not my life, is it? It's my afterlife. Actually, it's mine. You're the pilgrim, not me. You and the other bozos who parade in and out of here. You'll use one of the doors and go. I stay. There's no bathroom here because I no longer have to perform toilet functions. There's no bedroom because I no longer have to sleep. All I do is sit around and visit with you traveling bozos. You come in, you ask the same questions, and I give the same answers. That's my afterlife. Sound exciting? <laughs> Bill, who has encountered all the theological ins and outs during his final research project, decides he had the right idea while he was still in the hall. You're talking about purgatory. Oh, no doubt. The only question I have is how long I'll be staying. I'd like to tell you I'll eventually go mad if I can't move on, but I don't think I can do that any more than I can take a shit or a nap. I know my name means nothing to you, but we've discussed this before. Not every time you show up, but on several occasions. He waves an arm with enough force to cause some of the invoices tacked on the wall to flutter. This is, or was, I'm not sure which is actually correct. My earthly office in 1911, just so. I'd ask you if you know what a shirt waist is, Bill, but since I know you don't, I'll tell you. A woman's blouse. At the turn of the century, I and my partner, Max Blank, owned a business called the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. Mm. Profitable business, but the women who worked there were a large pain in the hinder end always sneaking out to smoke, and, this was worse, stealing stuff, which they would put in their purses or tuck up under their skirts. So, we locked the doors to keep them in during their shifts and searched them on their way out, 
Long story short, the damn place caught on fire one day. Max and I escaped by going up to the roof and down the fire escape. Many of the women were not so lucky. Although, let's be honest and admit, there was a lot of blame to go around. Smoking was strictly verboten, but plenty of them did it anyway, and it was a cigarette that started the blaze. Fire Marshal said so. Max and I were tried for manslaughter and acquitted. Bill recalls the fire extinguisher in the hall with better late than never printed above it. He thinks you were found guilty in the retrial, Mr. Harris, or you wouldn't be here. How many women died? 146, Harris says, and I regret every one, Mr. Anderson. Bill doesn't bother correcting him on the name. 20 minutes ago, he was dying in his bed. Now he is fascinated by this old story, which he has never heard before that he remembers anyway. Not long after Max and I got down the fire escape, the women crammed onto it. The damn thing couldn't take the weight. It collapsed and spilled two dozen of them a hundred feet to the cobblestones. They all died. Forty more jumped from the ninth and tenth floor windows. Some were on fire. They all died too. The fire brigade got there with life nets, but the women tore right through them and exploded on the pavement like bags filled with blood. A terrible sight, Mr. Anderson, terrible. Others jumped down the elevator shafts, but most just burned. Like 9-11 with fewer casualties. So you always say, and you're here. Yes, indeedy. I sometimes wonder how many men are sitting in offices just like this. Women, too. I'm sure there are women. I've always been forward-looking and see no reason why women can't fill low-level executive positions, and admirably. All of us answering the same questions and sending on the same pilgrims. You'd think that the load would lighten a little each time one of you decides to use the right-hand door instead of that one, he points to the left. But no, no. A fresh canister comes down the tube, zoop! and I get two new bozos to replace the one old one, sometimes three. He leans forward and speaks with great emphasis. This is a shitty job, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> it's Andrews, Bill says, and look, I'm sorry you feel that way, but Jesus, take a little responsibility for your actions, man. 146 women, and you did lock the doors. Harris hammers his desk. They were stealing us blind. He picks up the folder and shakes it at Bill. You should talk. Ha! Pot calling the kettle black. Goldman Sachs. Security fraud. Profits in the billions. Taxes in the millions. The low millions. Does the phrase housing bubble ring a bell? How many clients' trust did you abuse? How many people lost their life savings thanks to your greed and short-sightedness? Uh, Bill knows what Harris is talking about, but all that chicanery, well, most of it, went on far above his pay grade. He was as surprised as anyone when the excrement hit the cooling device. <laughs> the proof of his essential innocence, it seems to him, is that he is the pilgrim and Harris is stuck in this office. He's tempted to say there's a big difference between being beggared and burned alive, but why rub salt into the wound? Let's drop it, he says. If you have information I need, why not give it to me? Fill me in on the deal, and I'll get out of your hair. I wasn't the one smoking, Harris says in a low and brooding tone. I wasn't the one dropped the match. Mr. Harris, Bill can feel the walls closing in. If I had to be here forever, I'd shoot myself, he thinks. Only, if what Mr. Harris is saying is true, he wouldn't want to any more than he would want to go to the toilet. Okay, all right. Harris makes a lip-flapping sound, not quite a raspberry. <sighs> the deal is this. Leave through the left door, and you get to live your life over again. A to Z, start to finish. Take the right one, and you wink out. Poof, candle in the wind type of thing. At first, Bill says nothing to this. He's incapable of speech and not sure he can trust his ears. It's too good to be true. His mind turns to his brother Mike and the accident that happened when Mike was eight, next to the stupid shoplifting thing when Bill was 17. Just a lark, but it could have put a hole in his college plans if his father hadn't stepped in and talked to the right person. 
The thing with Anne Marie in the fraternity house, that still haunts him at odd moments, even after all these years. And of course, the big one, Harris is smiling, and the smile isn't a bit pleasant. Okay, so his ears did deceive him. Or maybe Harris was just getting back at him for suggesting that Harris deserved to be here in this limbo of bureaucracy. I know what you're thinking, because I've heard it all from you before, about how you and your brother were playing flashlight tag where you were, when you were kids and you slammed the bedroom door to keep him out and accidentally cut off the tip of his pinky finger. The impulse shoplifting thing, the watch, and how your dad pulls strings to get you out of it. That's right, no record, except with him. He never let me forget it. And then there's the girl in the frat house. Harris lifts the file. Her name's in here somewhere, I imagine. I do my best to keep the files current when I can find them. But why don't you refresh me? Anne Marie Winkler. Bill can feel his cheeks heating up. It wasn't date rape, so don't get that idea. She put her legs around me when I got on top of her, and if that doesn't say consent, I don't know what does. Did she uh, also put her legs around the two fellows who came next? No, Bill was tempted to say, but at least we didn't light her on fire, smartass. But still, he'd be teeing off on the 7th or working in his wood shop or talking to his daughter, now a college student herself, about her senior thesis, and he would wonder where Anne Marie is now, what she's doing, what she remembers about that night. Harris's job widens to a locker room smirk. It may be a shitty job, but it's clear. There are parts of it he enjoys. I can see that's a question you don't want to answer, so why don't we move along? You're thinking of all the things you'll change during your next ride on the cosmic carousel. This time you won't slam the door on your kid brother's finger or try to shoplift a watch at the Paramus Mall. It was the Mall of New Jersey. I'm sure it's in your file somewhere. <laughs> Harris gives Bill a, Bill's folder a getaway fly flap and continues. Next time, you'll decline to fuck your semi-comatose date as she lies on the sofa in the basement of your fraternity house. And, big one, you'll actually make that appointment for the colonoscopy instead of putting it off, having now decided, correct me if you're wrong, that the indignity of having a camera shoved up your ass is better than dying of colon cancer. Bill says, several times I've come close to telling Lynn about that frat house thing. I've never had the courage. But given the chance, you'd fix it. Of course, given the chance, wouldn't you unlock those factory doors? Indeed I would, but there are no second chances. Sorry to disappoint you. He doesn't look sorry. Harris looks tired. Harris looks bored. Harris also looks meanly triumphant. He points to the door on Bill's left. Use that one as you have on every other occasion and you begin all over again as a five-pound baby boy sliding from your mother's womb into the doctor's hands. You'll be taken home, wrapped in bunting, to a farm in central Nebraska. When your father sells the farm in 1964, you'll move to New Jersey. There, you will cut off the tip of your brother's little finger while playing tag. You'll go to the same high school, you'll take the same courses, you'll make exactly the same grades, you'll go to Boston College, and you'll commit the same act of semi-rape in the same fraternity house basement. You'll watch as the same two fraternity brothers then have sex with Anne Marie Winkler, and although you'll think you should call a halt to what's going on, you'll never quite muster up the, mortal fo the moral fortitude to do so. Three years later, you'll meet Linda Salvo, and two years after that, you'll be married. You'll follow the same career path, you'll have the same friends, you'll have the same deep disquiet about some of your firm's business practices, and you'll keep the same silence. The same doctor will urge you to get a colonoscopy when you turn 50, and you will promise, as you always do, that you'll take care of that little matter. You won't, and as a result, you'll die of the same cancer. Harris's smile as he drops the folder back on his cluttered desk is now so wide it almost creases the lobes of his ears. Then you'll come here and we'll have the same discussion. My advice would be to use the other door and have done with it, but of course, that is your decision. 
Bill has listened to this sermonette with increasing dismay. I'll remember nothing. Nothing. Not quite nothing, Harris says. You may have noticed some photos in the hall. The company picnic. Yes, every client who visits me sees pictures from the year of his or her birth and recognizes a few familiar faces among all the strange ones. When you live your life over again, Mr. Anders, presuming you decide to, you will have a sense of deja vu when you first see these people a sense that you have lived it all before, which of course you have. You will have a fleeting sense, almost a surety, that there is more, shall we say, more depth to your life and to existence in general than you previously believed. But then it will pass. If it's all the same, with no possibility of improvement, why are we even here? Harris makes the fists and knocks with the end, on the end of the pneumatic tube, hanging above the laundry basket, making it swing. Client wants to know why we're here, wants to know what it's all about, Alfie. <laughs> he waits. Nothing happens. He folds his hand on his desk. When Job wanted to know that, Mr. Anders, God asked if Job was there when he, God, made the universe. I guess you don't even rate that much of a reply. So, let's consider the matter closed. What do you want to do? Pick a door. Bill is thinking about the cancer, the pain of the cancer. To go through all that again, except he wouldn't remember he'd gone through it already. There's that, assuming Isaac Harris is telling the truth. No memories at all? No changes at all? Are you sure? How can you be? Because it's always the same conversation, Mr. Anderson. Each time and with all of you. It's Andrews! He bellows it, surprising both of them. In a lower voice, he says, If I try, if I really, really try, I'm sure I can hold on to something, even if it's only what happened to Mike's little finger. And one change might be enough to, I don't know, to take Anne-Marie to a movie instead of to that fucking kegger. How about that? Harris says, there's a folk tale that before birth, every human soul knows all the secrets of life and death in the universe. But then, just before birth, an angel leans down and puts his fingers to the new baby's lips and whispers, shh. Harris touches his philtrum. According to the story, this is the mark left by the angel's finger. Every human being has one. Have you ever seen an angel, Mr. Harris? No, but I once saw a camel. It was in the Bronx Zoo. <laughs> Choose a door. As he considers, <laughs> As he considers, Bill remembers a story they had read in junior high, The Lady or the Tiger. This decision is nowhere near as difficult. I must hold on to just one thing, he tells himself, as he opens the door that leads back into life. Just one thing. Then the white light envelops him. The doctor, who will bolt the Republican Party and vote for Adlai Stevenson in the fall, something his wife must never know, bends forward from the waist like a waiter presenting a tray and comes up holding a naked baby by the heels. He gives it a sharp smack and the squalling begins. You have a healthy baby boy, Mrs. Andrews, he says. Congratulations. She takes the baby. She kisses his damp cheeks and brow. They will name him William after her paternal grandfather. When the 21st century comes, he'll still be in his 40s. The idea is dizzying. In her arms, she holds not just a new life, but a universe of possibilities. Nothing, she thinks, could be more wonderful. Thanks. Oh. Yeah! <laughs> Thanks. Woo. Thank you. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Oh, God, that's great. Thank you. All right. Okay, I will read it again. <laughs> great, man. Beautiful. Thanks. We're going to take some questions, yeah? Yes. You got some time. So, you guys, we have two mics. Where are they? Yes, yeah, see, the, see the men in yellow? So we only have time for... Oh, I'm just making a devil ears. I'm doing shit, man. Freaking when Stephen King does it, it's, it's kind of scary. <laughs> so we have time for like a half an hour of conversation with the man. So go up to the mic, ask a question, but we only have time for probably seven, eight, nine questions. So probably no more than about 45 of you should go up. No, five, six, seven, eight, nine of you go up there. Go ahead. I'll try to keep the answer short, and then maybe we'll get a few more. Ask him only yes and no questions. <laughs> I stole that from you. <laughs> you did. Good evening, Stephen. How are you? I'm fine. I'm to your right. I'm Adam, and it's a pleasure to meet you. A little, a little closer. Is that Bigger my Bigger glasses, right? maybe? Wave. Jump up and down or something. Okay, I got you. I got you, man. Go ahead. So... Uh, in all these page turners, there's still a lot of poetry. How do wow, you find? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how do you find the balance, and how can you tell when the uh, the vocabulary is getting a little too onanistic? <laughs> did he say onanistic? He did, meaning uh, Onan being the fellow who is cursed for spilling his seed on the ground. But I spill mine on paper, so I'm okay. <laughs> No, nah, I don't. I don't. That would make for a very messy book. Let's not go there anymore. Look, the only thing you can do is you use your best judgment, you know, and I want to tell stories, but I love the language. I always have. I've, I fell in love with, with books, uh, with novels when I was a young guy, and uh, I fell in love with poetry when I was in college. Uh, people like... Uh, Richard Wilbur, Hart Crane, uh, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, all, all the, these guys, um, the, the quality of the language being like something that you could eat with a spoon. And I don't aspire to be lyrical, I don't want to do that, but I want to write as well as I possibly can. Um, I don't want to get diarrhea of the mouth, I want to keep the story rolling, but I want to do it as elegantly as I can. I think that readers sort of expect that. So, the. And then when the thing is done, uh, you give it to people, and uh, particularly an editor. And w one of the things I'm asked sometimes about editing, the more successful that you get, the more important it is to listen to an editor who won't let you hang yourself in Times Square. So I try to do that, and uh, I remember what Hemingway said, you must kill your darlings. Well, that seems a little bit harsh. I'm not able to kill all my darlings, but I do some. Next. Let's do this mic now, yeah. Hi. Howdy. Hi. I'm talking to Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> That's how old you. How old are you? I'm 11 years old. Yeah, baby. That's good. You go with your bad self. What's your question? Um, what was one of your like best writing moments when you had your g best idea and it just came to you? Oh man, what a great question that is. There have been a lot of times, you know, the thing is, I'm so lucky to be able to do this because you know, the thing is like, there are certain people in life where everybody else says, we have to grow up. You stay a kid and play in the playground. You'll be our designated playground person. And you go play and we'll enjoy what it is that you do. The, the best idea, in some ways, this is terrible to say, but I was in uh, Boulder, Colorado, and uh, I was driving on the, 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 the Boulder-Denver cutoff, Route 36. And I was listening to a radio station in Arvada. It was one of these Bible shouters. I love those guys. No, I do seriously love those guys. I love the cadence of them. You know, the sort, it's a beautiful thing. And this guy was talking about some Old Testament book, and he's saying, once in every generation, the plague shall fall among them. And we were living near, uh, uh, you know, a, a chemical warfare dump 
in that area and there was a lot of talk about it. And I thought, what if there was a plague and it killed just about everybody? And there were only a few people left. And I thought to myself, I'm going to write that. And that was just such a blast and it turned into the stand. That was good. I just want to know your name, 11-year-old human, because that took such chutzpah. How, what's your name? Von Suppel. Here's to Von Suppel. <laughs> Let's do that mic, yes. Hi, my name is Eileen, and I came in from Chicago to see you today. Nice. Because I think you're awesome. Um, my question is, I know... Home of Barack Obama. That's nice. correct. Nice. Um, yeah. Well, it's also home in Chicago, cause. <laughs> I, I admire your creativity and everything that you write. And I was wondering if you'd ever consider expanding that creativity into something. Um, Useful. No. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking more of an event, like a Halloween event. We were at Universal Studios Horror Nights oh, this I see, year. Yeah. And we always ask them, how come you don't ever get Stephen King to come here and do something, create something uh, there? And they said, well, we've tried. And I said, if I ever get the chance, I'll ask him why won't he do it. <laughs> no pressure. They wouldn't want a ride I created. <laughs> because there would be no repeat customers. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Ben Bolger, and I appreciate you coming to UMass Lowell uh, to speak today. I was wondering if you could reflect on when you were a student at the University of Maine and what you learned both in your classes and what you learned from writing for the student newspaper and how that shaped the development of you as a writer. Well, if you, if you want to be a writer, you really only have to do two things. You have to read a lot, and you have to write a lot, and you have to continue to get buzzed by what you're doing. You know, you have to continue to feel good about it. Uh, yeah, well, most writers do get buzzed, but I'm talking about a natural buzz. Why is she looking at me? <laughs> hey, listen, I didn't say it, you did. <laughs> but the thing is, you have to really like what you're doing. and. Uh, you know, I remember when my son, Owen, who has his first novel coming out next year, is terrific. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I have three kids. Uh, my daughter is a minister, and both my sons are novelists, and they both have novels coming out next spring. Um, Great. My son, my son Joe, uh, has a book called Nosferatu. Uh, he writes as Joe Hill. And uh, Owen has a book called Double Feature, which is so funny that it's just illegal. But in any case, when Owen was a, when Owen was a little guy, he was this little round guy, and he was uh, bigger than his age group and everything, and uh, he felt kind of stupid. And the person that he fixated on was Clarence Clemens uh, from the E Street Band, because, yeah, because yeah, Clarence was the big man, you know? And, and he, he blew the sax, and he was cool, and, and Owen wanted to be like Clarence, and he said, can I learn the sax? And we were delighted because our other kids, you know, had the musical abilities of bookends. So we were glad when Owen wanted to learn the sax, and Owen was very good, and he practiced the sax and everything, but it was clear after a year or so that he just wasn't getting a buzz out of it. And so, you know, he stopped and he found something that he did get a buzz out of, and that was writing. That was kind of like the family business. So you have to like it. The thing about college and college writing classes, I mean, they can fuck you up as bad as they can <laughs> make things for you, you know? Okay? Because, because it's all subjective, and sometimes you get bad advice on good work, and sometimes you get, you know, good feedback on bad work. But the thing is, man, the good thing about it and the thing that makes it worthwhile is that people take this job seriously. And so often when you get out there in life, people say, you want to be a writer, there's no money in that. Jesus, 
unless you want to write green cards, that might work. So I think that it, college is an important place because it gives you a, a chance to grow. And, and people take seriously what you want to do. College is great because, you know, maybe there's a tuition cost, but the dreams are free, and that's a good thing. Nice, yeah. First off, Mr. King, I would like to th say thank you to you for all the pleasure you have given me oh, over these God. years. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, all I can say is I'm glad it was good for you because it was, <laughs> it was great for me. <laughs> but I had racked my brains for months because this is a gift for my kids for my birthday for the question I was going to ask you. And it didn't come to me until tonight when you were telling the story of when you sold your rights to Carrie, mm -hmm. and you fell on the floor knowing that you had that car that needed the repair. My question is, did you repair the car or did you buy a new one? <laughs> We bought a Ford Pinto. <laughs> no! You didn't! You did. <laughs> but you know what? Hey, listen. We love that fucking car. It was brand new. It was brand new. It had that smell, you know, that new car smell. And we've been driving all this junk, you know. Uh, listen, one of the first times that I ever dated my wife back in the old, you, all, all those years ago, I'm driving around in this station wagon that I got from my brother, and we went over a bump, and the goddamn gas tank fell off. <laughs> right off in the middle of the street. And uh, there were some guys playing Legion baseball, and they, they were just totally, you know, drunk on their asses, but they came over and they wired up my gas station. <laughs> give it, yeah, give baby, it. Yeah, baby, that's all awesome. <laughs> uh, Yeah. Because that's how we roll, but it, that car was so good. That's like the best car. Birthday, Mama, what's your name? Nora Happy birthday to Nora. Happy birthday. Hi, my name's Diane. Yep. Three of my favorite things are reading, the Red Sox, and one of the best authors I've ever had the pleasure and privilege <laughs> of reading, Stephen King. I happen to have a picture here of all three, which is a very young Stephen King leaning against the wall of a vomitorium in Fenway Park, <laughs> reading a book. I'm wondering if you remember what book you were reading in this picture. <laughs> Hand it down here. Hand it down here. We're going to see that you get it back, OK? That's a great picture. <laughs> what is that? I think it's... Friends of Eddie Coyle. The Friends of Eddie Coyle. George V. By Higgins. George V. Higgins. You are wicked smart. <laughs> oh, God. Well, that's really weird because my name's Diane, too. So, weird. Um, obviously, your writing's amazing, and I think it's awesome, and I brainstormed a million questions I could ask you about your writing, but I can't stand here and not ask you a question about the Red Sox. So, if you were the manager, or the general manager of the Red Sox, would you have re-signed David Ortiz? Poppy? Not re-sign Poppy? You'd be insane not to re-sign Poppy. No, 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 no. 
trade Poppy and keep John Lackey, right? <laughs> no, of course keep Poppy. And if I can just be serious for a minute about the Red Sox, I think the smartest thing, a lot of people have asked me just lately, like I know anything, you know, uh, what I think about the moves that the Red Sox have made. And I really think that from a, uh, the standpoint of the management and the ownership saying, I want to make amends to the fans for the really terrible season last year, re-signing David Ortiz was the smartest thing they could have done because he's a goodwill ambassador. You know, not just to the baseball world, but to Red Sox nation. Yeah. So I first have to say um, thank you to my brother. He wanted me to say a good hello to Stephen King. He's covering my shift tonight so that I was able to be here uh, with, yeah. with, with, with my pregnant fiance who uh, now- And you also want to thank your cinematographer. Everybody and else, uh, <laughs> cue the music and get me off the mic right now. I'm just shitting on you, man. So, Don't so, worry about it. Thank you. A literary buzz, as the theme has kind of been tonight. Uh, my question is, we've been writing pretty hard for the last few months and had a lot of odd things happen. Um, I know you've spoken about you know, writing is magic and had a lot of malevolent almost forces trying to stop you from completing certain, certain things. So I'm just wondering if there's anything you can share here with us that's happened while collaborating either with someone uh, or on your own. Almost, I can't think of the qu right word, there might I just have to make one up, but like a hallucinogenic, almost like seeing red for, you know, um, Something like that, like a, mm -hmm. a dick-like experience, Philip, Philip Dick. Anything like that's happened to you? No. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, I'm not putting you down or anything, but no. How do you follow that? <laughs> uh, I'm up from Pennsylvania, nine hour trip on the road today. I'm sorry I missed the first 35 minutes of the talk. Um, my power went out for three days when we had that huge hurricane a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I read 112263. Yeah! by candlelight for three days, and it took me away from everything that we were suffering from to 1958 to 1963. I thought that the uh, female teacher... Sadie. Sadie, baby. Sadie, baby. That's how love is. You forget her name right away. I loved her so much. As a creation of yours, she was just the most incredible female fictional character that oh, I... Oh, gosh, uh, don't stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, he and I, likes this. Keep talking. My question is, did you set out, do you set out at the beginning of the book saying, I'm going to write an awesome female character in this book, or I'm going to make the best child, paranormal child that I've ever... No, I never do anything like that. I set out to tell a story and to try to make the characters as believable as I can. And with a, you know, it's a, with the case of Jake and Sadie, uh, I tried to write a, a love story that would be kind of like the way that people got together in the 50s with their feelings, their conflicted feelings about sex. And, and I, I just wanted to pour as much love into that relationship as I possibly could. Um, without, again, you know, this goes back to the first question about the language that you use, and, you know, I didn't want it to turn into a romance novel. I, I wanted to write something as true as I could about love, and it's such a, a line to walk between what's true and in your heart and the sentimental and the mawkish and that sort of thing, and I just wanted to make it as real as I could. And what I wanted, what you always want, is for reader identification so that so that the people, the guys who read that book will say, I would love to have a girlfriend like that. I would love to be in love that way. And have the women say, I'd love to meet a man like that. And if you succeed on that level, I think that it's, it's really good. Because I'm as much of a sucker for a love story 
particularly if it's a little bit of a star-crossed love story as anybody else. Um, I got this reputation as a, uh, a horror writer and everything, but I've really got a marshmallow for a heart, so. <laughs> Hi, Steven. My name is Maeve. I'm Yo. How you doing? <laughs> I grew up way out in Wyoming, and I actually moved out here to go to, to go to graduate school in Boston. It was a big move for me, but I actually felt comfortable moving to New England because I'd read all of your books, and <laughs> I knew that it was okay in New England. I figured if Stephen King lives out here and everyone likes it out here, that it was okay to move this way. It's literally why I felt okay moving to Boston to come to school. So I did it, and I still live here. Yeah, I'm but, a New England ambassador. Come up and get sucked by vampires. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go I ahead. Do, I do have a question. I, um, I, I first read uh, my first book of yours when I was 11. I read It. And great book. Great book. Yep. Scared the hell out of me. Scared the hell out of my little brother. Uh, terrified my family that I was reading it. And then I uh, read the rest of your stuff. And, um, but I felt a real connection to, to your young characters. And I noticed in all of your books that um, there's often a young character that's a protagonist that's an 11, 12, 13-year-old kid that takes charge and, and leads uh, through the book and is the one that, that solves, the, solves the mystery or, or takes charge and you know, mm -hmm. finds the talisman and brings it back and solves the, saves the day. And I've, just, uh, I've always wondered what it is um, about kids that you write so well and what it is it draws you to writing them as your protagonists in your stories. Well, with it, my kids were about that age when I wrote that book. And again, you know, they're the best uh, subjects for observation that you can possibly have. You know, I, I watched them, I saw how they operated in the world, I checked out their friends, uh, never in an intrusive way, I hope, uh, but to try to be, you know, sort of supportive and uh, to listen to the talk. That, to me, that's like one of the most important things is to listen to how people talk. And the other thing is that I had noticed uh, as a, a reader that while there were books that were written for the so-called YA uh, audience, young adult audience, and there were books written for kids, and those books were about kids, there were damn few books that were written for grown-ups about kids, but why not? I mean, that's a valid part of our life. It's the launching pad for everything else. And what I really wanted to do with it was to write about how kids have a wider bandwidth when it comes to perception and belief and, and the ability to accept things and how when we become grown-ups, that field of vision starts to change and, and close down a little bit. And so what I really wanted to do in it was to try to create a bridge, fictional and, and make-believe and scary. But childhood is a scary time. And I wanted to give adult readers a chance to relive those years as, as much as possible. So that's what I did. And uh, I'm fascinated by kids, by children. I think that it's a fantastic time of life. And I'm starting to sound like Michael Jackson, so I better shut up. <laughs> One more. One more. Two more. I, I, I want to make one comment, though, because I think throughout your work is, is, is a universal quality. You, you always see compassion for, for kids and people who are hurting, old people, people no one else pays attention to or looks at. And I really love that about Stephen's work, his compassion for people that no one else pays attention to. Well, thank you. Uh, I mean it, brother. This, your turn. We're, we're going to do two more. One from you and whoever fights for the mic over there. I'm, uh, I'm kidding. Don't fight. Don't fight. Uh, hello, my name is Jeffrey, and I'm a huge fan, and I can't believe I'm talking to you. Oh, man. And I can't believe I'm talking to you. I was wondering if you've ever been writing and you just, like, terrified yourself. Or... If I've terrified myself? Yes, and where all your characters go when you try to fall asleep at night. You know what? I, I don't really have, like, bad dreams or anything because I pass all that shit on to you guys. It's great. <laughs> it's terrific. And I love that. But yes, I have scared myself. Uh, I, I wrote a book called Pet Cemetery, And uh, I got 
pretty scared t toward the end of that book, kind of, you know, oh boy, just uh, some of the things. It was very black. And uh, when I finished the book, I actually put it in a drawer because I didn't think anybody would want to read anything like that. But they did, so fuck them. <laughs> uh, I don't mean that. I have, the, I have the greatest respect in the world for my fans. But the time that I scared myself the most, I was writing The Shining, and, uh, and, and I had, I, <laughs> it's like being, it's like being fucking Leonard Skinner, you know. <laughs> Play Freebird. <laughs> yeah. That's totally elliptical, but never mind. Uh, what I started to say is I was living in a house, uh, or rather, I, I had rented a room in a house that was away from the kids, uh, and I could go there for three hours a day, and I worked, and it was peaceful, it was in the Flatirons, and I worked for three hours and go home, and then I realized that uh, the, the young kid, Danny Torrance, was going to go up to this room, 217, and that there was a dead woman in the bathtub who wasn't really dead. And uh, I was working away, happy as a lark, and then one day I thought, five days to room 217. <laughs> and then it was three days, and then it was one day, and then it was, I was in the room, and that was a very, very brilliant scene in terms of what was going on in my head. And I was very scared when I wrote that scene. I think that comes across. Now, we have one more question. Make it a good one. No <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, oh, God, I don't know. No. Uh, <laughs> do you have a question? Do you have a question? I do question, have a question. After her question, and I'm going to walk uh, you down. All right. Okay. Question. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, there's so many. Um, good evening. <laughs> Hi. Um, where do I begin? Do you carry a cell phone? Do I carry a what? A cell phone. I know you had said Shit, before. no. <laughs> no, actually, when I'm on a trip like this, I have one, but I, I left it behind tonight, and I don't know my cell phone number or anything like that. So you do, because I, I've listened to you speak before, and you said you'd never carry a cell phone, and that was the cell, and you swore that it was evil? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think they're evil, but I do think that there's something uh, creepy when you walk down the street. We talked about this. And you see 10 people, and seven of them are like this. <laughs> you know, something little. And think about it. Think about it. Think about how they lower your IQ. What's the first thing anybody says when they pick up the cell phone? Hey, where are you? You don't think that's funny? Man, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but then maybe it's just sort of lost on me because I don't have a cell phone. Listen, you guys have been great to me, and I really appreciate it. It's like, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Don't forget the guy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. What are we going to do about the poster? We're going to sign chairs right now. Oh, okay. We're going to start this off. Oh, we got something that we got to do. We got to sign the chairs. Yeah, that's right. Well, before we do that, I know it's colder up in Maine than it is in Lowell, so we wanted to present you with a token of our appreciation. Oh, man. Wait a minute, the price tag's on it. <laughs> 55. <laughs> and a UMass Lowell Riverhawks hat. Nice. St Stephen, because of your generosity, we have raised over $100,000 for scholarships for English students for UMass Lowell. Yeah. That's terrific. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. That's terrific. Appreciate it. Thank you. And to, and to Andre DeBuse, if, I know there are a lot of young people here, 
who are thinking, who love reading, who love writing, they're thinking about where to go to a college or university. Andre Debus III is an example of the high quality that we have in our English department. Consider you, Mass Lowell. Andre, thank you for bringing Stephen here. Thank you. Appreciate it. He Andre made this happen. Can I, can I just say one thing, too? <laughs> We're going to get it. Hold on. Hold on. Hold, hold on. on hold on. Hold on. We'll, we'll get it. Marty Meehan, this is his kickoff uh, event in his, in his the Marty Meehan Chancellor Speaker Series. And this is his brainchild. And uh, I just want to give a toast to Marty Meehan and all he's doing. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. I'll give it wait to a minute. I'll give it to you. What's your name? My name is Brandon. I got to tell you one thing before we go. Yeah. That's okay. The American Insurance Association says that in a, any kind of a ga public gathering like this, 7% of the people who arrive in automobiles forget to lock their cars. And I'm not the one who wanted to say or would say that there's a maniac out there. But we know that such people do exist. And I'm just suggesting that you check your back seat because you wouldn't want to look in your rear view mirror. You want to sign the chairs now? Or? Yeah. Okay. Now, Stephen is going to sign the chairs, but we have the uh, winning numbers. But I can't read them, so I have them enlarged here. But I better sign the chair first. And yeah, you got to sign too. the chair. I got it right here, here. Hold that. Hold, you want hold. this one? Hold that. I signed a lot of shit, but this is my first chair. <laughs> so, Mr. King, if you will put your John Hancock right here. That's our plan. This is fun. Oh, man, this is going to look like somebody with a bad brain tumor. <laughs> <laughs> My, are we one, both signing both? Yeah, we're signing both. Let's go, baby. Oh. Look out, you'll get a rupture. You'll get a rupture. God, this is exciting to watch me sign a chair, isn't it? So we don't know how you're going to get these home. I got an SUV. You got a truck? Good. The winning number for the first chair is number 133156. That's my one, number. 133156. The second chair is 133479. Who do we got? The winner should go to the raffle ticket location near the Sal's uh, Concourse right up there. Two winners. I'll read them one more time. I just wanted to put Stephen King right there, man. One three three one five six one three three four seven nine. By the way, we made five thousand dollars on the raffle for scholarships. Nice. Thank you very much. That's good. Last, the last message is that the Lowell Bank Pavilion is going to be open. If you want to have something to eat or a drink, we're going to be open up here for a while. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thank Thanks you. again. Thank you, Stephen. Good luck, bro. See you, man. Thank you. Yeah, he was...